you think Common Ground is worth a buck, consider leaving a tip at lptv.org. This Common Ground special, Sculpting in Wood and Words, The Art of Kent Nurburn, is made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. I'm Kent Nurburn. I am a Bemidji writer. Most of my work is in the fields of general spirituality or Native American subjects, the bridge between the Native American and non-Native American communities. I've been doing it now oh, since the mid-80s. I was originally trained as a sculptor and that was really my passion, but it did lead me into writing. Years ago, I got my PhD in religion and art. It allowed me to practice as a sculptor, as well as to deal with the theories of creation. And I spent probably 20 years working as a sculptor, trying to inhabit natural forms. I worked in wood trying to inhabit natural forms with spiritual values. I tried to base in the human figure but tried to find the balance point between where things weren't simply the imposition of ideas onto the material but finding the form in the material, letting the material speak. And in the course of that the one tradition that really believed in the power of the material and the material having the life that animated the forms that it created was the Native American tradition. There were Northwest Coast Indians on, uh, in the Queen Charlottes who would carve faces in trees. The trees are still there. They would grow up and have the life of the tree change and inhabit the uh, the forms that they created. This idea that there was the power of nature as well as the power of the application of idea fascinated me. I've always believed that the human being is a believing creature, not a thinking creature. What we believe may be religious, it may be psychological, it may just be a way we interpret the world, but essentially we're driven by what we believe. And that was my interest in working in the arts. I wanted to see and experience, and to the extent that I was able, create works that expressed the deepest beliefs, that I had the deepest beliefs of the people I studied. I fell into sculpture when I was in Germany. I used to wander the streets. Uh, you know, I had a girlfriend back in the States, and I was uh, you know, duly heartbroken as someone in his 20s would be and was just wandering kind of a lost soul on the streets and started going into these little uh, Kunst, uh, Bauernkunst museums, the farmer museums. And in there I came across some of these crucifixes that had been carved by the old farmers and they had so much more life in them than any of the abstractions that I was studying in graduate school, where we would do such things as discuss theories of salvation across the, uh, the, the comparative dimension or the comparative aspect of theories of salvation in different uh, religious traditions. Well, that was a far cry from seeing these works that have been labored out by these farmers from their pure essence of their own belief and their own desire to communicate something of the spirit. And I said, that's real. That's more real to me. And I set to work that afternoon and I started. I didn't know what I was going to do. I'd always sketched like most people do in notebooks and so forth, but I'd never really pursued it. Um, at about two in the morning, I, w I couldn't stop. I was still at it. And I said, this is something different in my life from anything I've done before. I stayed with it. I produced a piece that my sister still has that was a wedding piece for them. It was in the early 70s and it was a, a kind of a, uh, it was a crucifixion and it was pretty good. And I said, this, this, this touches my heart. This is something that's important to me. And I went back to Stanford and told them that I wanted to uh, become a woodcarver. And they said, we think you probably need a little time off. Uh, we won't say you've had a nervous breakdown, but let's just say that you're 
your professional route does not seem to coincide with what we expected from you here at Stanford. So I left. I took a year off and I never went back. And I committed myself to studying sculpture. I said I wanted to become a sculptor and a teacher and I wanted to deal with the embodiment of belief in physical forms. So anyway, I ended up back in graduate school at a joint program at Graduate Theological Union and the University of California at Berkeley, a PhD program in religion slash theology and art, where I told them I wanted to train to be a sculptor. I wanted to teach from the bench. I didn't want to be a theoretician who also sculpted on the side. They were amenable to this. Um, I went and studied in Italy, studied with stone carvers, did as much classical training as I could get, and continued to work as a sculptor. Whatever it was that allowed a person to be a natural, I didn't have. Sometimes I would struggle my way through to something that was very brilliant. But it was always the image that was stronger to me than the sculpture. I could inhabit the emotion. I could find the emotion of something and find a way to fit it into a material. But I didn't have strong, a strong sculptural sense. Anyway, I continued struggling to make a living as a sculptor. And I've often said that a sculptor is a notch up on the food chain from a poet or a composer, uh, none of which are likely to uh, you know, move you into the upper echelons of uh, economic society. But I worked as a sculptor for about, oh, geez, must have been 15 years. And then my uh, wife-to-be and uh, I moved up here to Bemidji. She had a job working for the Red Lake Times. And she eventually ended up at Bemidji State. I continued to sculpt, but she had her kids and we needed, the economic basis of sculpting was absolutely, uh, you know, it was absolutely hopeless. So I needed to find a way to make some kind of a living. The opportunity came to go to work in uh, Red Lake. They had a position open for someone to do, to teach history, it was a grant program. And, and I applied for the job and they interviewed me and I said what I'd like to do is try to collect the stories of the elders. My wife and I, when we had lived in the Twin Cities, had run a newspaper in North Minneapolis. And I knew how to, to collect materials. I knew how to put it together. I knew how to listen to people. I knew how to get their voices. The people on the school board at Red Lake liked the idea. They said, this sounds good. I was really working off the model of the Foxfire books. Uh, which were done in Georgia a number of years ago, where a teacher took students out and interviewed, uh, interviewed the folks in the hills about everything from making cane chairs to moonshine. And I said, I'd like to just take the students out into the reservation and interview the elders. So we did. And we ended up, over the course of the years, producing two books. One was called To Walk the Red Road, Memories of the Red Lake Ojibwe People. And what we did is we went and got photographs from the Red Lake archives, from individual family members. We went down to St. John's. We uh, went to the Beltrami County Historical Society and then interviewed people on the reservation. And some of the interviews were profound and significant. Interviewing Tommy J. Tommy Stillday, the spiritual leader Panema, was a very deep and meaningful interview. Then there were others where you interview someone and they talk about when they used to slide down the hill into the lake in old turtle shells. So the stories were just wonderful. They poured out. We produced these books. They became pretty significant books. No one had really done anything like this. The students and I got to go to uh, oh, the Minnesota Indian Education Association. I went up to Alaska to British Columbia and uh, talked and traveled with some of the, the coastal tribes. It was a wonderful experience for me. It was a wonderful experience for the students. And I realized in the course of this work that the native people had something that I'd been seeking. It wasn't something that I could appropriate and take into myself, but what it was was a, uh, an equanimity about life and an ability to embrace life and death in a sort of a in a continuous fashion. 
they embraced a larger sense of family than I was used to. They had a quiet joy that ran very, very deep. They were a people at peace. And of course, there were all the sociological issues that we all know about over the top. But at the core of their being was this fundamental belief that spirit lives in everything. It wasn't the, you know, we have this residu residual, uh, we have this residual Judeo-Christian belief where the human being is at the top and everything is created, everything else that's created is for our use to somehow uh, use to redound to the glory of God. Now that's fairly theological, but that's basically the idea that the human being is created in the image of the creator and everything else is lesser. Not in the native way of thinking in any of the traditions. It's much more that everything, every, everything that's on earth has spirit within it. And the spirit that it has within it is meant to teach. And that you learn from the animals, you learn from the cycles of nature, you learn from the winds, you learn from the skies, you live with a humble awareness that everything is a teacher and you are part of the whole. And this was kind of what I've been looking for in life. The idea that the tree was alive, which I'd run into as a sculptor, the idea that the tree was alive was simply part and parcel of their understanding of the world. The tree was a teacher. When I worked as a sculptor, and I would work on a particular tree, and that tree had had a difficult life, I could feel its sadness. If it had a kind of nobility, like I remember working on pieces of oak that had a real nobility to them. They stood up to the world like an oak does. Uh, their character was in the wood. Their character was in the action of working on it. Walnut, which I loved very much, was a very recessive tree. It, it was a feminine tree. It produced, uh, it produced fruit for the world. Uh, all of this that had been theoretical to me was suddenly actual in the native way of looking at the world. I found that I had met traditions that spoke to me in a very fundamental and very essential fashion. So I found myself absolutely in love with the work I had done with the Native people. Getting to know the elders, getting to teach the students. I felt like I had found a place where I was doing something that was not only important, it was essential. And I decided at that point that I would turn a lot of my work to the issue of giving voice to a native way of understanding the world. And it's a fine line you have to walk because there is absolutely nothing in my mind more odious than the white person who dabbles in Indian themes for fun and profit. And there also is the danger of being a dilettante, um, an exploiter, but that wasn't what I was about. What I wanted to do was give voice to the voiceless because I had the audience as a white writer, as a person with a PhD, as a person with the bona fides. I could start to bring these stories up, bring out something of the character of the Native experience. And really at heart, what I was about as a sculptor, as a writer, as anything else, and what I remain about is trying to find an authentic American spirituality, one that grows out of the land, one that has to do with an embrace of the moment and a consecration of the ordinary, and not one that has to do with ideology and imposition of theological belief. The Native people do not proselytize. They do not try to push their religion on other people. I remember Chief Joseph, when I was studying Chief Joseph, said, uh, we do not fight about religion. We've seen the white people fight about religion. We don't want to learn that. Well, I don't want to teach that. I don't want to share that. 
Uh, but my work as a writer, my work as a sculptor, has always been at heart the work of a teacher. I want to teach. Of course I want to entertain. But to me the most important thing is that I somehow put forth something of value and significance that when people read it, they're made slightly better than, uh, you know, than they were before they read it. Chief Joseph, one of my heroes, said, come, let us put our minds together to see what kind of lives we can create for our children. I take this very seriously. I think that the education of the young and speaking to the young is one of the most important things that you can do as a writer. Earlier this fall, I went to Trek North Charter School in Bemidji and spoke to one of the classes that had been reading my book, Neither Wolf Nor Dog. You never know when the touch you make is the touch that's going to change a young person's life. I love the chance to go talk to young people in schools. Who are guests? I know that you've, you've read a, uh, one or two or three more, you know, maybe more books by Kent Nurburn. Let's be uh, a good audience today and thank you Kent Nurburn for coming. Hello everybody. Uh, well, just so you know that I'm not some alien being uh, walking in. Um, my son went to school here uh, in its uh, first couple of years, and I was involved in starting Schoolcraft. And when this spun off as an idea, uh, I was one of the people that was uh, originally involved in just, just the seed of the idea of uh, Trek North. So I want to talk to you about two things. I want to talk to you about neither wolf nor dog, and I want to talk to you a little bit about writing. Neither Wolf nor Dog because uh, you're reading it and just seeing the author of a book is always kind of interesting to people. How many of you have read it or are in the process of reading it? Okay. And I wanted the book to weave the sacred and the profane, the ordinary and the elevated, the tragic and the comic all together. So it had an integrated feel to it. But almost invariably, when people first come to it, one of the things they spot is the humor. And they like the humor. And I'm glad for that, because I like the humor too. Now, why did the book work? Well, it worked. I didn't know this at the time. But why it worked is because of the fact that I was a white author. I could take the non-native reader and say, come on with me. Let's go out, let's walk into the India, Indian country, and I will depict it as absolutely accurately as I possibly can, and I will hand you over to the Indian people. And they will talk back to you in the, in the person and voice of Dan, and to some extent Grover and Winona. All the things that non-native people, white people, uh, you know, I'll use white as the example because they're mostly white people, are, were bothered by, I put in my mouth. Like uh, Dan and I are driving through the reservation. We bounce our way back down the hill, then turned onto a gravel road that skirted a dusty amber wash. Houses were set back from the road about a half a mile apart. They all had the look of prefab post-war bungalows gone to seed. Doors hung by one hinge. Windows without screens were covered by blankets. The front yards were nothing more than spotty patches of dirt with kids' bicycles and old appliances lying randomly on the ground. Everything seemed to have been left just where it was dropped. There was no sense of order or indication of effort to keep things clean. One house had an old spool table sitting in front of it with a pile of oily car parts on it. Another had a large frame made out of telephone poles with an engine block hanging from it by a heavy logging chain. Beneath the engine, a rusty bay Chevrolet with no front wheel sat on heavy timbers, its hood open as if the engine had just been extracted like a tooth. It was a world of half efforts. Nothing had been brought to a conclusion. The only sign of industriousness was the inevitable line of laundry flapping behind each house in the ceaseless prairie winds. The white sheets seemed like flags of defiance in a landscape of despair. I had always been mystified by the willingness of people to live in squalor when only the simplest effort would have been required to make things clean. Eventually, I'd come to shrug it off to the old sociological canard that it reflected a lack of self-esteem and a sense of hopelessness about life. But in my heart, I knew that this was too facile, too middle class in its presumptions. 
but it certainly was preferable to earlier explanations that people who lived like this were simply lazy and shiftless. I wanted to ask Dan. I was sure he'd have a point of view, but I hesitated. The question seemed to run to the heart of the contemporary Indian life. I needn't have worried, though. The old man saw me glancing around and came right to the point himself. Bothers you, doesn't it, he said. We passed a house with a burnout station wagon lying on his side in the front yard. Yeah, I guess so, I answered. I just don't understand it. I've been waiting for you to ask, but I guess I got, you figure I got forever. He gave me a mock blow on the shoulder. I'm damn near 80, Nervin. You got to work faster. I grinned at his humor. Sorry, Dan. I'm on white man's time. He chuckled several times and pointed at another of the passing houses. The top of an old Plymouth protruded from a patch of weeds. What do you see when you look out there, he said. Do you really want to know? I asked, didn't I? I see a lack of concern for the land you claim to revere. You mean you see a bunch of right? <laughs> His candor was liberating. Yes, uh, that's what all white people see. You drive through our reservations and say, look at all the junk cars and all the trash. What do you think we say when we drive through one of your cities? I really don't know. We say the same thing. Just because you have everything scrubbed down and in order doesn't mean anything. What's bigger trash, a junk car or a parking ramp? We can tow the junk car away. The parking ramp has to be torn down with bulldozers and wrecking cranes. The only reason you don't see it as trash is that you still use it. When you don't need a building anymore, it's too expensive to fix, then it's trash. To us, it looks like trash all the time. Well, in there, you see, no native person could come out and, and, and make that same statement that I made about, uh, yeah, it looks kind of like trash to me. They wouldn't because you'd want to defend it if you were native. You want to defend your culture and, the, and your, your life. But all the white people driving through reservations always whisper, why do I live like that? What's wrong with people? You could just do anything. And so I can take that point of view. And I could do that. And I could be the voice of the white inquisitor and seeker. And then the native person could respond to me and say, this is how it really is. And here's what you're not really seeing. You know, I like music a whole lot more than I like reading and writing. Uh, I write for a living, but music is what matters to me. Uh, but that doesn't mean that music isn't in the writing. Listen to this. All right, what is that? It's a beat. <laughs> Poetry. Boy, you are on over there. OK. <laughs> My cat, Sid, is a very fat cat. His belly hangs almost to the ground. There's that sentence. Beat out. If you're really, really paying attention to your writing, you listen for the music inside of your writing. And you make it fit the needs of what it is you're trying to say. If you're doing something that's frantic, is moving quickly, you write with a lot faster music. The key, though, is not you don't do this consciously. You've got to get real good. You've got to really get your chops. And then when you get it, this happens naturally. You, you, if you sit down and say, oh, no, I'm going to do uh, staccato musical sounds, you know, maybe it's a good exercise. It's like playing scales, and you have to learn it. But better to just be aware of this when you're writing and try to find the music inside of the sentences that you write. I'm sure you're all well aware of that astonishing thing that the human brain does. If I play you the first four notes of a piece of music, you're going to know what that piece of music is if you know it. How can that be? What is that in our brain that allows us to just grab a piece of music instantly? And that's a power. And as a writer, one of the things I do to grab you is I'm constantly aware of the inside of the music in, uh, you know, in what I write. I care about the music of my writing. It is not insignificant to say that I was trained in religious studies. I study religious texts. Prayer in any tradition has a rhythm about it. The two things that matter to me are music and pictures. I want people to see what it is that I'm writing about. 
My dirty secret as a writer and a reader is that I'm a sub-vocalizer. I read very slowly. Things go into my ear and come out of my mouth at about the same speed. I don't read conceptually. I used to look at this as a great deficiency, that I couldn't read a whole paragraph. I couldn't shoot through pages and take in ideas. Things have to come in at the speed at which you hear them. And consequently, when I sit down to write, things come out to be heard as opposed to being thought. And because I was trained as a sculptor, I'm constantly looking for ways to give you pictures. I want pictures musically described. I had an amazing experience as a writer in that one of my pieces went viral on the internet and has had over three million hits and three million viewings. As a result, a group of filmmakers from the UK came to visit me here at my home in northern Minnesota. One of the key elements, I believe, and this gets me in trouble with literary types, is that to me, anything that goes through memory becomes fiction. Well, someone's capturing something in some video. I really believe in the power of story, but I believe that the stories are always a distortion of reality. Unless you are transcribing something with a microphone and you put it down exactly as transcribed, choices are being made at every point that you interpret. It was good for me. I, I couldn't live there on a long-term basis. Uh, I enjoyed it because the place to be young. If someone walks into a room and they meet three people and one of whom is a dentist and one of whom is a hairdresser, and one of whom is linguist. Each of those three people is going to see the person that walked into the room in different ways. And if asked to describe them, we'll describe them in different ways. We bring to our perception our own historical experience and our own personal experience. And this is always a very complex matrix of meaning. To assume that what someone tells you is fact is not the case. It's always an interpretation. I'm trying to interpret the world for you when I sit down to write and tell a story. I want to give it to you in a way that you see real dialogue. The dialogue has to sound real. It has to follow logically. It has to have a musicality to it. I want to give you sensory descriptions. I want you to see it. I want you to smell it. I want you to hear it. I want you to taste it. And I'll try to embed ideas, but I'll never put an idea out in front and say, here's an idea. Now watch me extrapolate from this idea or somehow reveal it to you. I want to embed my ideas in story. An old native man uh, once told me, always tell stories. He said, people learn best by stories because stories lodge deep in the heart. Storytelling is the oldest of the literary crafts. It seems absolutely essential to me to acknowledge this and to be humble before it. Tell stories, make stories embody the truth that you want to contain. This is a very different thing than trying to give factual information. So I get in trouble very often because my stories are, I wouldn't say they're parables, but I attempt to give you what is important in the story to make it come alive for you. The cab driver's story. That story was as accurately re rendered as I could remember. Was it distorted? Probably, because it was 20 years before. What's happened in my mind in that time? Like one of the things that came up in the course of a discussion about it one time, people always say to me, why would a woman come ask to be picked up at 2 in the morning to go to a hospice? Well, I can't give you an answer to that. I have no idea why that was the case. But someone else said to me, actually I think it was my, one of my stepdaughters said, um, well, did they even have hospices then? And I said, well, geez, I don't know. Was that the term? And I don't know that the term was even in existence then. Maybe she said a convalescent home. Memory, it's a lens. I think that the purpose of memory is to winnow experience and to bring it back to you. We're looking to have you reconstruct that story. Or mm -hmm. You tell that story right. in, in your own words in such a way that we can reconstruct. And I can take it down a few different streets Absolutely, and see where it goes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, uh, I'll, I'll retell it as I remember yeah, it, not exactly as it's in, in the book, but uh, or 
in the version you saw. But let me let me just start talking and see what comes out of it. Sure. And go from there. If you have to sit and yawn while I find my way into the story, that's just fine. Should we start like at the time at, at that time in your life when you were actually a cab driver? And let me start. I decided I'd do something completely different. So I took a job driving a cab. And this was in Minneapolis. Minneapolis is a part of a metropolitan area with over a million people. Urban situation, um, a place where every permutation and combination of humanity exists. And every permutation and combination of humanity gets in a cab at one time or another. I decided to drive at night, partly because it seemed romantic, partly because uh, it was the, it allowed me to sculpt during the day. And I took what was called the dog shift. And the dog shift is when you drive overnight, you drive all night. You watch a rhythm of the city that's really quite exciting depending on when you start. You get the rush hour traffic of the people going home. Then you get the, the diners who are going out. Uh, you get the people who are coming back late at night. Then you get the drunks coming out of the bars. Uh, and that's the time of interest and danger. And then it's fairly true that nothing good happens. As I tell my son, nothing good happens between uh, two and four in the morning. And nothing good does happen between two and four in the morning. So that was pretty much a lull time. I, I look upon my writing as an archeology span of memory. I don't like to write from direct apprehension of things. I wouldn't like to look out this window at this beautiful winter scene and try to describe it. What I would rather do is look out this window at this beautiful winter scene, take in as much of it as I can, the colors, the textures, the slight movement of the wind, everything that I am and that I've learned in the course of my life, living in the North Country with the experiences I've had, take it into me and then come back to it a day, a week, a month, a year later. Because what I remember is what's significant. That way I don't get confused by a plethora or an excess of detail. It's the sculptor in me. What I'm doing is picking the salient objects, the salient moments, the salient elements, and giving them to you to create a picture that will allow you to enter into the experience. So I like to work from memory. I find it to be a very valuable tool and a tool of truth telling because what you remember is what's significant. So really, the act of writing, the act of preparing to write becomes a spiritual exercise. It's preparing yourself to look out at a scene and knowing what it is that you need to be open to in order to understand and express it, to communicate it in the most meaningful way possible. Different people will see different things. If you drop me in the middle of New York City, or if you, or if you drop me in the subways, first thing I'm gonna do is cover my ears because I can't stand the noise. Does that mean that's the most important, significant thing about the subway? Someone else may see, uh, you know, may see Joshua Bell playing his uh, violin uh, for pennies on the, you know, in the, in the basement, in the subway, as actually took place one time. Whereas if I go in there, Joshua Bell can be playing, and I'm going to be covering my ears because what I hear is noise. I'm not prepared. I'm not trained. If that's what I wanted to see, if that's what I wanted to communicate, fine. But every writer has certain skills. Every writer has certain capacities to apprehend. And one of the things where this has become an asset to me is in telling Native American stories. Because what I bring to looking at life on a reservation, what I bring to engagement with Native cultures is my background as a non-Native, white, suburban kid who grew up. And so when I go in and look at the Native world, what I'm bringing to bear on it is the experience of an outsider who tries to become an insider and be as sympathetic as I possibly can. But I'm an outsider looking with the eyes of an outsider. And thus, when I get a reader who is also an outsider, they can come with me. They walk in and they trust me because I am them. And the non-native reader walks in with me and says, yes, I trust you because 
you come from my world and you see the things I see, you ask the questions I ask. And if I hand the reader over to the native voice and authentically present the native person and the native point of view, much like in the oral history books, then the native readers say, yes, this man is letting us tell our story. So it becomes a dialogue between two points of view, each accurately rendered. Martin's one of my favorite young people. You can't imagine how tough it is to be living with a foot in two different cultures. No, I'm flying to Fairbanks, and then I gotta fly from Fairbanks to Anchorage, and then from Anchorage to Cordova, and then Cordova to Yakutat. Oh, you kidding me? They can't no, so, make it that know, hard, eh? I, I had a great travel agent, so, you know. Martin lives his traditional life as a Clinkett man from Yakutat, Alaska, and at the same time, he lives in contemporary society, does work in Hollywood, and yet he keeps a strong spirit about everything he does. <laughs> he don't like dogs, and he don't like coffee. <laughs> and he likes girls, And he though. likes cats. Martin came to visit me here in Minnesota, and we sat down together and batted ideas back and forth for a while, and it was a wonderful afternoon. Both books, Wolf at Twilight and uh, Neither Wolf Nor Dog, are, are very well done. Oftentimes, it's like you see non-native authors or non-native people making films about Indians, and it's like, it's, it's always an outside perspective. So a lot of the times, the people that are doing those types of films or the people that are writing those types of books they put in there what they want to put in there and they put in there what's going to sell or what's appealing. What I like about Neither Wolf Nor Dog is it's, well, obviously you're traveling with Grover and Dan, some Lakota elders. So, and, and really the book is, you know, in a lot of ways, it's Dan's book. You just put the words in the book, you know, so his message comes across and it's inside perspective of native people being put on a paper by Kent, who's a great writer. It's not just one perspective, it's a lot of different perspectives because you explain how you uh, understand their perception of reality through your own perspective and how you view the world and truth and, and how people can learn from that. And I think that's just, I think that's perfect because the, uh, there's a big gap in communications between natives and non-natives, it's always been like that. Um, I think we're moving in the right direction in a lot of ways and I think in a lot of ways we're not moving in the right direction but um, for somebody you know like when I when I read that book it was it was a good feeling and I feel like it's a step in the right direction for bridging that gap in communications and um, helping people evolve their understanding of the differences in culture. My current project and when I say current, I mean really current because the deadline for it was 11.30 this morning. Uh, did I meet my deadline? Don't ask. Here's what it is. This is going to be the third book in a trilogy. First was Neither Wolf Nor Dog on Forgotten Roads with an Indian Elder. The second was The Wolf of Twilight, an Indian Elder's Journey Through a Land of Ghosts and Shadows. And the third one is called the girl who sang to the buffalo, a child, an elder, and a sky too big to dream. This book has been a real struggle. Sometimes they come easily. Well, they never come very easily to me. But sometimes they come hard. Sometimes they come really hard. This one, man, I've had to arm wrestle this one into existence. But this is its current state. This is the manuscript. When people ask about, oh, it must be fun to be a writer. Well, it's fun to have written these books. Does this look like fun? It's like having God's punishment of a term paper. Here, how many pages? What are we at here? We're at 326, okay? That's 326 of probably 3,000 pages that I wrote in the course of trying to get things right. And now I'm at the stage of having printed out the manuscript. I, I need to work from a hard copy. Writers have different ways that they work. I do relatively well with a pen and pencil, but I don't trust what I write on a screen because it doesn't read in the same way as it does when I put it into a hard copy. I love the computer, I love writing on the computer, but I need to print it off. And then when I print it off like this, then I can go back and read it. It looks more like a book, it feels like a book, but things that felt wonderful in the course of writing them turn out to not read very well when you see them on a page. Here, for example, is a couple of pages of my own editing. What I had originally written is, though I felt alone and vulnerable, I had no choice but to face Winona and hear what she had to say. 
upon rereading that, uh, I didn't like alone and vulnerable. You'd have to know the whole context, but I decided instead what I wanted to say was, though I was nervous and uncertain. Why? I don't know. But in the flow of the entire manuscript, that was a better phrasing. At least it appears to me at this point to have been a better phrasing. So there's a simple change I made. Here's one where I had two versions. I'll do that very often. I'll make a little slash, and then I'll write one ending to a sentence, and then I'll write another ending to a sentence. And then I know that I have to pick one or the other because I've got that little slash between the two of them. Those are the only two editings on this page. Here are some really nasty pages. I mean, I'm not even sure I'll be able to interpret everything that I did here. Telling me to take this section out with a, just a little editor's mark of removal, changing sentences, uh, writing in new sentences, Xing this out completely, adding little phrases. Uh, clearly, I'm involved in wanting to really change what it is that I was up to in this particular section. Another version, actually, on the back. Uh, and I get through this with all these changes, and then it's like we've just gone down a stretch of bad road. I come out, and all of a sudden, whew, things are better again. Uh, obviously, what was going on in these pages wasn't adequate to my understanding to move me into these further pages. Here's a good example of two separate possible titles to a chapter. So if I decide I don't, don't like one, out it goes. And then I've got the one that I'm going to use. Life goes on, page after page. This is what I go through with my own work. This work, unedited, read just fine on the computer screen. But when I printed it out and I looked at it, everything needed to be moved around. Dialogue didn't go into the right place. I had repeated myself. There were phrases that I wanted to put in. It, it becomes a task of rewriting. Every writer I know has a different relationship to the process of rewriting. I try to write so I don't have to do a lot of rewriting. It, doesn't al it isn't always the case, but I'd like to think that my work is close to completed when I'm done. I think it's a skill that I have in that I'm not wedded to my own words entirely. I've got a lot of ego about them. If I think someone's messing with them in a way that is inappropriate, I'll squawk and kick and refuse to be edited. But if someone can improve something, it's a joy to me. When I think about editing, it's again like I'm talking to children or young people and I'll say, take a look at the back of your neck. And they'll say, well, I can't look at the back of my neck. I'll say, well, I can. I can look at the back of your neck easily. Well, that's what a good editor does. They look at the back of your neck and you can't see it, but they can. And a good editor is an absolute joy, someone that doesn't try to write your book, but tries to bring out your voice and can say to you, this doesn't quite connect with me, or you could say this better or expand here. Someone who comes to your work with an excitement for what you're doing and says, this is good, but I can show you how to make it better. Looks like 342 would do just fine. And a good editor is worth his or her weight in gold. I'm a pretty good editor for myself just because I've been a sculptor, and a sculptor as a remover. And subtractive sculpture is the art of taking things away until the less becomes the more. So I'm a good editor. I'm willing to take away things. One of the rules that, that I, I remember hearing many, many years ago, if you're jammed up, if there's something you absolutely refuse to give up, that's what you have to throw away. It's a balance point between cleaning up and clarifying and overworking something. There's always something to be said for the first moment of creation. It has a brightness and an excitement about it that you never really achieve again. But at the same time, if it doesn't communicate, it needs to be adjusted and nuances have to be put in. But like a sculptural form, if you sand it too much, you take the edges off it and you end up with something that doesn't have its innate character. Now this piece really is an odd foreshadowing of a lot of things. It was a meditation on the land that I was living on in this little hidden valley in California. And it was the first time I'd ever lived on land that hadn't been heavily trodden on by the concrete of Western civilization. And it was really a study in the spirit of the land and the spirit of the native presence that I felt there. I was young. 
It was in the early 70s. I had just come back from Germany, and this was my attempt, without any serious training, to enter into the world of sculptural form and images. And what I discovered when I look at this now, 30 some years later, is how strong the image is, that it's essentially emotion embodied. And that was what I did well as a sculptor. I wasn't strong in sculptural form. And ultimately, at some point, sculptural form becomes essential because it's the grammar of the craft. But what mattered to me was the quality of the image and the quality of the emotional experience that I could put into the wood. What I want to do, why don't you take a shot of this? This is just something that just struck me that I find delightful and fascinating. I talk about art as an expression of spirit. I brought out that sculpture that I did and set it down and realized that the little Eskimo sculpture I have there has exactly the same emotional affect. That was a piece that I purchased. I was in a little museum shop in a church in Churchill, Manitoba. I walked in and there were these wooden shelves and this little cold wooden museum. I looked across all the shelves. There were probably two, three hundred little sculptures there, little carvings that the Inuit people had done for sale to such tourists as came up to Churchill at that time. And I walked through those shelves and in that wonderful way that happens when either when you're going through a museum or looking for a rug or whatever it is, you walk and you say, that one. And I looked at that little piece, and it had some wonderful sculptural values, the capacity to stand on its own, um, the gesture. But now that I set the two of them next to each other, I realized what attracted me was that it has the same emotion as the sculpture that I had done 20 years previously. And the two of them sit together, probably a fair reflection of... Uh, my own minor key understanding and experience of life. It fascinates me when I look at them. They have the same angle of repose and expression. They have the same tension between the sadness in the eyes and the attempted peace and resolution in the mouth. They're kindred, kindred across medium, across time, across space, one made by someone in Baker Lake, north of Hudson Bay, probably created, you can tell just by the way that, that it sits in the hand, that the person that worked on it held it in their hand while they worked. Completely different way than a piece made by someone who would lay the wood on its back and work with chisels. And yet, they're brother and sister piece across time and space. Only art does something like that. and I just, it, I never get tired of the magic of looking at art forms. And these are two that uh, I happen to be fortunate enough to have in my life that I can look at at any time. And you don't even have to open them like a book or put them on like a piece of music. They're right there for me all the time. I loved sculpture. I loved wood. I loved the power of wood. And I loved, in this case, the power of walnut. In many ways, I wish I would have stayed with it. My son has always asked if I was going to go back to it. And I don't think the time will come uh, for a number of reasons. But it was essentially just a different modality from writing in terms of giving expression to human experience and human feeling. And it's always fascinating when you mix art forms, when you cross art forms, to see what you can learn from one and what you can translate to the other. In this piece, I was still very concerned with detail. Sculpture is an art form of choices. How do you depict sadness in an eye? How do you balance a look of resolution and peace? I'm going back into when I did this sculpture many, many years ago, and I remember trying to balance a look of benign resignation in the mouth and deep ineffable sadness in the eyes. How do you do this? How do you take that notion, that emotional notion, and put it into a physical form? Sculpture is one, was one modality by which I would try to do that. 
I might deal with exactly the same issue as a writer. How do I get a feeling of resignation and a resigned peace into a story that also has ineffable sadness in it? These are the kind of issues that transform and, and go across the borders of an art form. A musician, a, uh, let's say, a guitarist playing Concierto de Aranjuez could try to get that same feeling of sadness and peace into the music. This is what I love about the arts, is that they can do several things at once, they can go directly to emotional realities, and they bring it forth for people to see and to take into themselves. Sculpture is an interesting art form because it occupies our space, but transcends our time. I always tried to work at roughly human scale, just so it would be the size of a human presence. And yet it does transcend our time. It sits there. It can be, if not eternal, at least a long-standing presence in your life. I've had this piece around for 30 years. Writing doesn't do the same thing. Writing is only present when you read it. And then it takes root in the imagination. And it grows inside the imagination. And you interact with it. Very different effect than the effect of living with a sculpture constantly. Music, you make it, it disappears. That was one of the fascinations of doing the book on St. Francis, Make Me an Instrument of Your Peace. What was an instrument in his time? It was something that made music and then the music was gone. You couldn't capture it. They had no technology to capture it. It only existed in the making. These are the kind of magical elements of art forms that just fascinate me. I happen to, in my life, have landed on the art form of writing. But ultimately, it's only because that's one at which I had skills and which I could pursue. Sometimes you'll produce a book and you don't know what you've got. On one of my books, a little book called Small Graces, I used to say, well, I uh, set the bar low and I cleared it admirably. People tell me that they love the book. And I go back and say, what is it that they love about this book? Well, it has a domesticity about it that I didn't notice while I was writing. It's about home. It's about family. And a lot of my books are about travels and isolations. Individuals, myself as an auditor or a looker, seeing the world through the isolated vision of a lonely traveler. I don't analyze these things. But you find out after the fact. Someone will come and tell you that this book meant something because of some particular aspect in it. And they give you your book back. And it's a great gift when they do that because they're bringing the book alive. And they're increasing your knowledge of yourself and your own capacities as a writer. I don't know what I have at the end of any book. The only measure I ever have is when I go back after three years, six years, ten years, and look at a book, and if I say, I could never write that book again in this way, I've done something good. If I say, oh, I wish I could redo this one, then maybe it wasn't so good. But it's a great pleasure. Like, I've got a book that's coming up on its 20th year right now called Letters to My Son that was written when my son was just a toddler and I wanted to write a book about what I believed in life if I were to die before he reached adulthood. They want me to add a little bit to this book and put out a 20th anniversary edition. I go back and read it and I say, oh, I had such clarity and confidence at that time. I wasn't as compromised as I am now. Uh, I love that book. It's a snapshot of my best self in time. And this is kind of the joy of being a writer. You create artifacts. They're done. They will outlive you. You grow. You watch your own growth. You watch the growth of the book in the world. They're like your children. They grow up. Some of them surprise you. One you think is going to become the president of the United States, and he ends up uh, diving in dumpsters. And another one you think is going to, you know, be working as an assistant manager in a strip mall for his entire life, and he ends up being the head of an international corporation. You just don't know how they're going to come into life. And you love them all. People will say, well, what's your favorite book? And my answer is always, well, do you have children? Yes. Well, who's your favorite kid? 
you love them all. They're all different. They're all characters. They're all quirky. They all have their great moments. They all have their weak moments, just like all of us. That, to me, is the real excitement of producing a book. The actual process of writing a book, it isn't always fun. It's hard to keep your focus. If you work on something like this book, is this one I'm working on now, eh, it was 2009, I started it. And like I said, it's been a, it's been a hard labor. Imagine something that you started. In two, imagine yourself in 2009. And now imagine yourself now, and this is being filmed in what, 2013? How much have you changed in that time? The first paragraph I wrote in 2009 was written by a completely different man than the one who's writing the last paragraph in 2013. How do you keep a continuous thread? How do you allow the book to grow and yet retain continuity and an authentic and consistent voice? These are real challenges. It's hard to sit down and find that self. It's a book that's supposed to be the third in a trilogy. This book was written in 1995. Do you think that my voice is the same as it was in 1995? No. I see the world differently. The details I see running through memory, like I said, is a different experience. It's a real challenge. It's an emotionally fragile occupation. You have to be very, very careful not to let yourself get knocked off center by life events, by outsized emotions that don't fit into the book that you're doing. You have to have a kind of clarity. And at its best, writing is like walking into a garden. You turn one way and you see blooms, teeming and richness, flowers. You see life you never thought was there. And you just continue through this garden and it's a great and wonderful experience. On the bad days, writing is like putting dragging a rock up a hill. It's like that endless term paper. And you don't know. For me, the challenge is to set myself up emotionally and physically. So when I sit down to write, something begins to happen and it begins to come alive. And I'm in the garden. I'm not pulling the rock up the hill. Sculpting in wood and words was made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund.